So our next panel will be introduced and moderated by Dr. Kevin Grumbach, who has, for more years than he likely will admit, been an important thought leader and advocate for health equity and community-engaged research at UCSF and nationally. And he has provided visionary leadership for CTSI's community engagement core since its inception. Although, are you going to start, Abby, or I'll let Abby introduce herself, and uh, we'll go from there. Good morning, my name is Abby Cabrera. I'm a project manager at the Center for Excellence of Primary Care and a navigator for community engagement and special populations in the Clinical Translational Science Institute at UCSF. I'm excited this morning to share two community engaged collaboration efforts that I hope can contribute to best practices for impactful research and institutional shifts. And more importantly, you will hear from our community partners following this presentation. I want to start with sharing some foundational principles of patient and community engagement that we found essential. It's important to recognize that one, community and patient expertise is key to good and impactful science. Two, similar to what we previously heard, we cannot understand health without health equity. Good health is equitably distributed and accessible. Three, academic institutions are not traditionally set up for achieving health equity. Our default practices and policies at academic health centers are not always designed with equity in mind. With that said, the fourth principle introduces two approaches with successful patient and community engagement in academia. It required institutional level and project level interventions. For this presentation, the focus is first, institutional level intervention through a program based on advising, input, and consultation. And second, a research and project level intervention through research partnership with community-based organizations. The COVID-19 Research and Patient Community Advisory Board launched in May 2020 in response to a rapid development of COVID research to provide an easily accessible an efficient mechanism to help connect UCSF researchers with patient and community members for input and consultation for COVID research projects. We recruited over 30 advisory members, and over the last two years, they have consulted on close to 30 COVID-specific research studies, projects, and policies. In September of 2020, the Share, Trust, Partner, Organize COVID-19 California Alliance was created as a community-based participatory research project to address gaps in COVID information and vaccine accessibility. The PCAB was initially funded by a supplemental grant from the larger Aspire project. That's the Accelerating Systematic Stakeholder, Patient, and Institutional Research Engagement. It was housed in CTSI and the Center for Community Engagement. The recruited advisors provided a range of expertise and some had previous research advisory experience and came from various networks, other CABs, different uh, PFACs, which are the Patient and Family Advisory Councils, and as well as the Aspire Stakeholder Board. <laughs> Woo! So we've heard over and over again, we know the data on disparities. And so we reached out to other individuals in other networks and invited those from underrepresented populations. The PCAB was also uh, very, um, it was, we wanted to note that it was supported institutionally by the Research Development Office. And now Stop COVID. Stop COVID is funded by the NIH Community Engagement Alliance, and we were funder focused. Our populations of focus included the Black and African American community, Chinese American community, and Latinx community. We employed community-based participatory research principles in partnership with three community-based organizations serving these priority populations. Instituto Familiar de la Raza, Nico's Chinese Health Coalition, and Rafiki Coalition for Health and Wellness. Following a grant renewal and driven by the data, we welcomed a fourth partnership with the Samoan Community Development Center. 
And this project is also supported by CTSI's Community Engagement Program. And focusing on the interventional, uh, in, intervention at the institutional level in community engagement. So pictured here are screenshots of various PCAB consultations from a handful of the PCAB members between 2020 and 2022. Many of these members were then invited to be advisors on research projects. Many continued on to other, uh, other research committees and two were specifically invited to sit on the UCSF COVID Interventional Research Committee. Some co-authored papers and others were trained as facilitators for the skills-based training for the California Connected Virtual Training Academy for COVID-19 Vaccine Research, as previously mentioned from Dr. Kelly Taylor. To date, the PEAC have advised and consulted for 27 various research projects, studies, and policies such as those touching on environmental factors and advised on air pollution and COVID, various clinical trials dealing with therapeutics, even the COVID vaccine. Our, our PCAB engaged in emergency department safety net questions and shared ideas on feedback on survey administration in the ED, and this was during a time in 2020. They advised on the school reopening of San Francisco focused on special populations, such as pregnant women, populations of focus in Asian Americans, those with liver disease, focused on patient outcomes, and even telehealth delivery. And beyond that, our PCAB also advised on UCSF clinical research policy and those for the IRB, and even policies beyond to, uh, for national initiatives. Some of the insights from our PCAB can be noted here. Led by Dr. James Harrison and Dr. Nynika Palmer and co-authored by PCAB members, we conducted an in-depth evaluation of the PCAB and recently published the process and results in a paper in the Journal of Clinical and Translational Science. PCAB members shared insights on advising early in research studies or projects. They expressed a desire to do more. They want to do more and a lot of them are here. They want to serve in co-leadership, or even more. In addition, we evaluated our researchers, and here you can see some of their insights, noting the unique feedback and thoughtful suggestions. What you've seen on the two slides are just some of what we are incorporating into the CTSI Research Action Group on Equity, also known as RAGE. The PCAB participated in a word cloud exercise with the following prompt. In one or two words, describe your experience of being in the PCAB. Some of the words that might stand out to you, humbling, stimulating, impactful, essential. Other words, challenging, anxiety. How about provoking, frustrating, and irritating? The collective words from the PCAB remind us of some of the unintentional consequences. As we include community partners through the research or project process, we must recognize the burden and burnout from our community members and CBO partners they face day in and day out, especially through the pandemic. We must be aware that some of the issues we bring up and seek consultation for may be stressful. It may evoke triggers associated with cultural, racial, and or historical trauma. And now transitioning into the project level in, uh, intervention. One of the reasons of the success of the Stop COVID community-based participatory research project and its rapid project development is attributed to the historical partnerships and maintain trust. As mentioned earlier, if you build that trust with community partners, when the time is ready, you're ready to go. And that's exactly what happened for our Stop COVID project. The partners were our co-investigators and we engaged in this true research partnership. Our Stop COVID team sought to explore community views about COVID vaccination, including barriers, facilitators, trusted messengers, and other issues affecting interest in and access to vaccination. The study aimed to develop culturally tailored outreach strategies informed by community members and co-created with community partners 
that facilitate respectful, informed decision-making about the COVID-19 vaccine. We conducted 25 in-depth interviews and 10 focus groups in English, Spanish, Cantonese, and Mandarin. Focus groups were co-facilitated by a UCSF team member, as well as one of our CBO co-investigators. The results from our in-depth interviews and focus groups led to the development of three practice and policy briefs, also translated in Spanish and Cantonese. We disseminated these between May and September 2021. One paper on barriers and facilitators, another on knowledge, concerns, and beliefs, and another on trusted messengers. However, following this, we recognized a gap in the voices from young adults and therefore conducted an additional six focus groups with transitional aged youth. Results revealed a gap in Pacific Islander voices and concerns. As we received additional funding to continue with the project, we invited the Samoan Community Development Center as a fourth partner. Our Stop COVID team recently published two papers on our work, vaccine readiness among multiple racial and ethnic groups in San Francisco Bay Area, as well as a COVID-19 perceptions among young adults in color in the San Francisco Bay Area. In this new year of funding, which began in March 2022, we began discussions with our Stop COVID team, and this led to a recognition of the need for collective community healing from the trauma of COVID and the need for solidarity in mourning those we lost. We decided that one of the aims of this new year of funding would support collective community healing. And here is some of the Stop COVID team in partnership with the Nikos Chinese Health Coalition at the annual Chinatown Community Health Fair. In November of 2022, Stop COVID partnered with Instituto Familiar de la Raza to support Loco Blanco and the Brava Theater for Dia de los Muertos to once again stand together in solidarity and begin to heal as a community. In addition to the community healing ceremonies, we are currently conducting in-depth interviews to learn the community-based organization and faith-based organization perspectives on how pandemic-related work affected their relationships with community members, other CBOs, the Department of Public Health, UCSF, and other institutions to explore their experience of these partnerships and lessons for future efforts. We know that these are only two engaged efforts among many. The partnership takeaways I'd like to leave with you are grounded in communication, recognizing the power and impact of partnerships, and building and maintaining trust. We must foster a safe environment for clear and open communication that values feedback from all partners and deliver communication in plain language and ensure it is language accessible. So we're staying away from lay language, we're using plain language. We have to communicate our expectations. For example, this can relate to, are you even going to incorporate the feedback that you hear from your consultation? Are you going to take our suggestions? You have to state your expectations. We must value the knowledge and the expertise of our partners and their community priorities, not ours. We have to share leadership and engage in shared decision making. Let's close the loop. This goes beyond dissemination. What happened after your consultation session? What was incorporated? What worked? What didn't? You must communicate back with the community members and those involved on your research. And lastly, trust. That is woven in all of the presentations and I hope you remember that word, trust. We all have to equally show up. We have to show up and follow through. We must recognize the expertise of our community partners and also ensure that we pay them in an equitable and timely manner. In a timely manner. <laughs> and in wrapping up, recall the foundations of principles around community expertise and how we can restructure academia in partnerships with community. As we do this, I want to remind us of the underlying principle of institutional humility, which is a version of cultural humility 
that centers institutional programs and practice. I hope you leave with these takeaways and engage in meaningful community partnerships. And I want to acknowledge that there are many individuals in this audience today that contributed their time as a partner, staff, faculty member, or COVID PCAB member. And we want to encourage you, I want to encourage you to partner with community and community experts. If you don't know where to start, you're not sure, we can help. There is a QR code that you can scan and you can request any consultation. So don't, don't be afraid to hold up your phone and, and, and scan that QR code. Thank you. <laughs> and now, the best part of this presentation, I would like to introduce to you our panelists. So first, we have Michael Liao. Michael's career in social work has spanned various settings, including child welfare, domestic violence prevention, supervised visitation, mental health, and addictive disorder treatment and prevention. Michael is currently the director of programs for Nikos Chinese Health Coalition. For the past 22 years, Michael has been engaged in capacity building, technical assistance and training, community-based research, community organizing, coalition building, and advocacy. Michael joins us as a community partner from the Stop COVID Project. Welcome, Michael. Ramon Ramirez, who has fluid pronouns. Ramon is a Mexican-American gay cis man living in San Francisco with a career in clinical health education, HIV prevention, and activism with a passion for performance, drag, comedy, and fundraising. And I quote from Ramon, I have a very close and particular relationship with my mother. Burning Man is my religion. It is almost, imposs it is almost impossible to be 100% bilingual. And I am in a long-term relationship with myself. <laughs> Ramon joins us as a member of the COVID Research PCAB. Welcome, Ramon. And Lisa Teeler. Lisa serves as the Executive Director of the Bay Area Community Health Advisory Council, a community health-based organization focusing on eliminating health disparities in diverse communities across generations in San Mateo County. She consults in the diversity, inclusion, and equity space and has facilitated sessions on diversity, inclusion, racial equity, and allyship for several nonprofit healthcare and government organizations. Lisa also serves as a community advisory board member and co-chair for the UCSF Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center and various other CABs at UCSF. In November 2021, she formed Umoja Health San Mateo County. Lisa joins us as a member of the COVID Research PCAB. Welcome, Lisa. And I'd like to introduce the moderator for our panel, Dr. Kevin Grumbach, Professor at UCSF Family Community Medicine and Director for Community Engagement at CTSI. Great. Um, well, thank you, Abby. What a fabulous presentation. You nailed it. That was just beautiful. And thank you, uh, our three uh, panelists here today, to sharing your time together. So let's just jump into it. Um, I'll just start on, on my left, starting with you, Lisa. Um, Look, the context here is the pandemic had arrived. You know, this all the programs that Abby was referring to started in 2020 in these uh, connections. I mean, there were some existing connections, but really collaborating on these programs. So Lisa, let's start with you. Really tough time. You're deeply involved and overwhelmed with all your organizational work and things like that. And then you get a call from one of us saying, hey, uh, how about contributing some time to being on the the Patient Committee Advisory Board for helping UCSF researchers uh, be more effective in their research. What motivated you to say, gee, that would be a worthwhile use of my time? <laughs> well, I'm gonna join the uh, fan club for Dr. K. Uh, I think, she, I don't, I think she's, she had to leave, but um, I talked to her. I said, <laughs> Is this going to be worth my time? Because I got a lot of stuff going on. I've got folks who need medication, food, um, vaccines, masks, whatever. And uh, she said, hey, check it out. Um, and then, of course, I talked to Abby and Paula. 
and they were amazing. And then they talked about like what this, this cab was actually gonna be doing. Now, to be fully transparent, the idea of influencing research was appealing to me uh, because I'd worked at Genentech for over 30 years uh, supporting clinical trials. And so I thought this was another way for me to support and also have the community voice represented because a lot of times we're, as you've heard, and as several of you already know, we're kind of an afterthought. And so I thought this was an opportunity to be at the forefront to really make a difference. So that's why I joined. Thanks. Ramon, let me turn to you, same thing. You were in the midst of a lot of work going on when, when Abby or uh, Paula called. What, yeah, what motivated you? Thank you. I um, started listening my com to my community and um, um, a lot of recent immigrants, uh, they were losing their jobs. And, and these are the people that were not getting unemployment, they were not getting stimulus checks, they were not, uh, they were just getting fired. Um, a lot of uh, people from the trans community or, uh, that had to do sex work uh, for a living, uh, they started uh, losing their housing and, 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 and they had nothing to eat. Um, and so inside of me, I was like, what can I do? Back in the days, we used to grab a bag of condoms and go pass them around, but this wasn't the case. And we couldn't uh, hand out uh, masks probably, but I wanted to do something. And, and, and when I heard from you guys, I was like, oh my God, this is something that, that, that I could do and that it's really gonna bring the voices of those people from my community that they, they are very, very lowly represented in, uh, at this table. So I was very excited and I wanted to um, bring those stories to, to, you know, to the researchers and to hear what, what, what was happening on the streets. I was living on 24 and Shotwell. I was in the middle of something crazy by the BART station that became something, you know, we couldn't believe now it turned into some kind of like swap meet or something. People were just trying to make money to eat and, and, and bringing that, those visions to um, the researchers, I think it was very important and it was, it, it was very rewarding for me to do that work. So do you, you think research has a role to play in addressing some of those Completely. needs? Completely. They, they, I, I don't think they, 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 didn't, they didn't have enough eyes to be in, in all these communities and see what was happening in, in different corners of the city. Great. Michael, yeah, maybe for your chair. So Lisa and Ramon joined on the uh, Patient Community Advisory Board, which is really getting, you know, more traditional researchers at UCSF who, you know, there was this rapid launching into COVID research. You remember, I mean, there's this urgency and a, and a lot of uh, missteps made, frankly, that, that were offensive to the community. So this was to bring the community voice to say, we have to do this research in a more responsible and effective way. So Michael joined with more as a co-investigator on this community participatory research project around vaccinations as a vaccine, as we were uh, awaiting the uh, authorization of the vaccinations. The so same question, Michael, what made you say, you know, being part of a collaborative research project would be meaningful for you and Nikos? Yeah, good morning. Um, so uh, when Nikos was approached initially by Dr. Grombach and about this opportunity, we were excited. We were um, eager to dive into uh, being able to have more data and f more information about COVID. Um, Nikos obviously has already had a long um, history and fruitful relationships with UCSF in, in its various different components with student-led um, initiatives and organizations through the Center for Community Engagement, through various different research um, partnerships. So that was really helpful. But we also knew that by the time we had that conversation, Nichols was already pivoting our services to um, meet some of the gaps we were seeing in the community in the fact that there were a serious lack of bilingual um, um, COVID command center workers to go into the community to do rapid uh, response and mitigation. So we were already recruiting community CBO volunteers to go into the many SROs or single room occupancy buildings in San Francisco's Chinatown um, to do, um, um, to reach out, to do education, to promote testing. 
So we knew that um, the research project would not only help us inform our on the ground um, response and mitigation, um, because that, that would be really critical, but also it would help um, amplify our uh, broader advocacy efforts on the city level. Um, we were doing a lot of work to ensure that the city was providing equitable COVID response for communities of color, for limited English speaking communities and those with um, um, uh, uh, marginalized, uh, with um, particular needs. So um, one last thing was that another motivation was knowing um, when we were deciding to join that other partners like Rafiki Coalition and Instituto Familiar de la Raza were already on board. And so that really also gave us extra incentive in knowing that we could use this opportunity to build cross-racial solidarity during these very challenging times for all of us and that we would have a platform to be able to promote that kind of solidarity work. So that was important as well. Michael, that, that's... Let's put a pin in this cross-racial solidarity because I want to come back to that because that to me was one of the most moving part of my experiences collaborating with many of you. Um, Michael, so you, let's, uh, let me follow up on that, what you were talking about. Uh, Abby showed how we did these focus groups and interviews with folks from different communities. A lot of it was we heard about some of the rollout of the vaccination programs was not really making it accessible, either linguistically accessible, it was all through, you remember my turn, how you had to sign up online and reboot 20 times when there was short supply. I mean, take yourself back to then, and that's what we heard a lot from the focus groups. This, you have to go to Moscone Center, and how do you get there, or to City College. Abby showed our team, you know, with with Michael and others put out briefs. We didn't wait for publications. Hillary's comment to start the session, you know, that's, that's not where you can translate it very readily. So we put out these policy briefs to try to share with Department of Public Health, other, do, do you think what we learned helped influence to make vaccinations more accessible in let's say the Chinese community? Yes, I think definitely um, the timely research and the data made great um, impacts in how we'll, I'll talk about in two ways in both how the community and community-based organizations like us um, responded to COVID um, and also on the city level. Um, so, you know, related to what you just mentioned, we, we were... Um, uh, uh, on one hand, we weren't very surprised of the uh, how the rollout with the vaccine happened because we knew there were already a lot of barriers and challenges when it came to testing. Um, and that was already um, really difficult for us to have to advocate for um, accessible community testing sites. Um, so we were getting ready to kind of uh, face the same things. So it was really incredibly helpful to have um, interview data, focus group data, from limited English speaking Chinese seniors in particular, who shared a lot initially about um, you know, the um, technological and the language barriers that you alluded to. And not only that, but the need for more low tech, low barrier, old school. Um, you know, a lot of folks talked about wanting to be able to go talk to a person live in person to get help with navigation or to at least be able to call a telephonic hotline um, for those who have those barriers that we mentioned. Um, and that information actually resulted in discussions that uh, Nikos would have with many of our member organizations who ultimately sought out funding, secured funding from private foundation to create a, a hub approach for um, providing um, navigation support for as particularly um, limited English speaking Chinese seniors in San Francisco Chinatown, not only to navigate for vaccine appointments, which was a, a huge hurdle, but also uh, wraparound resources such as um, providing escort or accompaniment for many of our seniors who uh, were physically and literally afraid to leave their homes because of COVID and also rise of anti-Asian uh, sentiments and hate. Um, and so there was a lot of that, 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 that was inspired by the data. On the city level, a lot of information that we gather, such as, you know, many Chinese immigrants were getting 
confused or misinformation perhaps about vaccine safety because many were getting news from overseas, so news from Asia that often were uh, you know, discussing types of vaccines that were different than what we were offering here, but getting confused, um, really directly resulted in shaping how the city also crafted its in-language messaging for the Chinese community in their briefings and in their community town halls. Um, and so that was another piece that really made a difference as so well. So I think now you're understanding why maybe this conference is co-sponsored by the Collaborative Research Network and the IMPACT program, because right, this is about how do you get research to have impact. And I think this is, it would never have had the impact without the partnership with CBO's community groups and then really helping to connect it with the receptor sites. All right, Monique, we have a few minutes left. I think we'll push it to five minutes maybe, Mike, if we could. Um, the um, Monique Lassar said she'd come back to be compensated to tell us all the things we've done wrong at UCSF. But I'm gonna just ask for a freebie from the, this panel here. Uh, now, I mean, Lisa, yeah, what, you know, from doing this, because I know with the PCAP, yeah. the feedback was, man, we're having to say the same thing over, you know, the next set of researchers come in. You know, what do we need to do to learn to do this better on the kind of researcher side of the house or the academic researcher side? Well, I think, you know, again, it's the same story. Listen and implement. I mean, when the community tells you that something's not going to work or you need to do this differently, then you actually need to listen and do it. I mean, it's really not that difficult. And so... <laughs> Well, for some of us, it is, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but then you, and the question is why? Yeah. Why, is that, why is that an issue? If you're gonna go to the community and say, community, you know, we're getting ready to do this, we'd like to be involved, and the community says, well, okay, but we need money, um, and we need it to be culturally competent, and we need to be in the, you need to be in the neighborhood, not, you know, yeah. at an ivory tower building yeah. or location, then, you th then you make those changes. And so that was part of the frustration, not just, I'm not just saying maybe UCSF, but I said in just general, yeah. when the community tells you something, yeah. listen and do it. It's, I mean, it's, that's what's very frustrating to me, yeah. um, it yeah. is, is being able to set, keep saying the same thing over and over again, but, expecting a different outcome. That's yeah. craziness, yeah. right? Yeah. So. <laughs> So it's probably, it's partly you're saying, listen to change, but I want to go one step further where maybe we could do it better in the first place. So oh, let me give well, you a- Well, then there's that. Yeah. <laughs> so let me give you a specific example. I think you were a consultant on a project that one of Dr. Taylor's colleagues was mm -hmm. leading. It was a big study of COVID, you know, incidents, trying to do a more rigorous uh, tracking of who was getting it. I was involved as a co-investigator. Mm -hmm. I think you may have been a mm -hmm. consultant on that. And it was, we were trying to recruit all these people to see, you know, really more scientifically who was getting COVID in the early stage of the pandemic. And we had not involved community groups to think, how do you recruit from the population as a whole? So you then, your organization came on mm -hmm. as a kind of collaborator, but it felt like, why didn't we do that to begin with? Yeah, I mean, I, that's a good question. It's, it's, it would have been nice to have been at the table when they actually were designing the study. Yeah. It, we could have got, gotten our questions at, asked. Um, and then we could have also redirected how we approach the community because, you know, the things that were being asked is like, well, we were saying, well, that might not necessarily yeah. work. Yeah. You might have to do something differently. Like if you're gonna tell somebody to go to a medical center, like how are they gonna get there? Yeah. When are the hours available? Are, are they gonna have uh, information in different languages? Are you going to provide funding? You're going to do a bus card, a gift card, gas yeah. card. I mean, those types of things would have been great to have those discussions yeah. from the very beginning. Yeah. Or redesign the whole thing and say, well, why don't we just go to the people themselves and they don't have to get in their car or on the bus yeah. or borrow something or get on yeah. Lyft or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it was, um, and I appreciate that you recognize that from the, when we started down yeah. that road and, yeah. and, and acknowledged it. So it's like, okay, now that we acknowledge it, let's, how are we gonna do things differently moving yeah. forward? Yeah, I, I, I wish we could keep getting, you know, you're talking 
Abby, you talk about institutional change and institutional humility, how we can create a culture that that's built in up front, not having to take corrective actions right. midway into a research project. Ramona, I think we're going to give you kind of final word. Well, Abby will get final word, of course. No, 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 but, but Ram Ramon, yeah, there was some frustration I noticed after several consultations you did, right, about, come on, folks. Just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was the one always asking, is this in Spanish? Do you speak Spanish? Oh, I love Espanol. No, 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 no. <laughs> Cultural competency, that... That, it's, uh, it, it was very important for the work that we're doing. But to be honest with you, I'm, I'm very happy that, that you guys were listening and you guys came to, our, to the communities and, 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 and listen. Um, now that you're presenting and, and, and you guys going to the Dia de los Muertos and all these things, that is when the institution is going to the communities to learn more about that, about us, about communities just in general. Um, it, it, because my thing was, I, I want to bring the, 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 the voices of those that can't make it here. But I want to make sure that it's done in a, in, in a quality uh, uh, form because I, in a, in a clinic, I'm always having doctors being, oh, hablo espanol. And then the, the Latinos go like, I think they can rock it, and they, they get lost. No, it's very important to make sure that there's, there's communication. And, 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 and thank you. That was, yeah, you guys listen and, 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 and try your best. So that's well, important. Well, thank you, you. You made a difference. I, I think we should wrap up. I will, before I get to Abby for one last, I do because of something you said, Michael. I have to say, it was, we've had these meetings uh, on Zoom with various peoples of the Stop COVID uh, team, with Michael and others. It's been one of the most moving experiences for me and just tremendous love and um, solidarity across these groups, across different uh, racial, ethnically identified communities and when for example the anti-Asian hate crimes started emerging to see a group that was from the Latinx sector from African American black from Pacific Islander sort of say how can we help and we're we're we feel you and we're there together where so often this stuff gets very divided you know and there was there was racialization of the anti-Asian hate and the way it was being portrayed and who are the perpetrators and to have these incredibly honorable people saying we need to stand together in San Francisco um, uh, collectively. I, I, so I think where people have talked about the relationships that are built to feel like I, Abby, and others could be a part of that. I mean, it's a great privilege and it enriches us in so many ways and makes us such a better community of which we then can be a part. I don't know, Abby. I think ending on just the note again, beyond institutional humility, it goes down to the individual and that myself as a, a staff member and all of us in here that are researchers, we have to also approach it in our own humility and recognize, listen, and respond to the community voice. On that note, thank you so much, uh, colleagues, for being here. Thank you.